Hello, thank you for joining. I am Galo and I'm going to be talking about sales metrics for the platform engineer. When I started working in this space, I joined into a newly formed team, four or five people, most of us new hires, so we had no political capital inside the company. Uh, leadership gave us a fast mission, something about helping product teams improve productivity, but nothing more concrete. And nobody was expected to use our tools. Uh, we still had to go out and convince everybody to do so. There was also a fair amount of internal competition, other teams building developer tools, sometimes in scopes overlapping with ours. In this situation, the team functioned as a small startup in, uh, inside the larger, the larger company. Our plan was to try and offer some small tools and services, gain adoption, and see if we could scale the team and the portfolio from there. And here we quickly saw that we did have the engineering skills. Uh, we were software engineers, we knew how to build software, but we were severely lacking in many other skills that suddenly became extremely important for us. I'm going to be talking about marketing here, but uh, there was also product management, UX design, etc. Here I think engineers have a great opportunity because if you picture a Pareto distribution of non-engineering skills, most of us are naturally going to be on the very far left of the curve. This is inconvenient sometimes, but at the same time, it means that whenever you put a tiny bit of effort in learning any of these disciplines, you're getting massive returns. You multiply by 10 or by 100, whatever you knew before. And this is a massive advantage compared to other engineers that may be trying to do product management or sales or uh, UX, but haven't put the effort to learn some of the basics. And in a way, I think it's super easy to create a relatively powerful Swiss Army knife of non-engineering skills that are going to complement your core expertise as an engineer, and they will make you uh, more versatile and more effective at your job. Uh, when I started trying to figure out how to sell the platform, I remember going on, on Google and just searching for marketing tips or sales tips. And I came across this quote from Theodore Levitt that basically says, you shouldn't be focusing so much on the product you're trying to sell. You should be focusing more on the needs that you're trying to cover. It is reasonable and, and I think a, a powerful quote because it gives you a pattern. You can you can keep asking the same question. Why is the customer uh, interest could be the customer interested in this product? What are they trying to achieve? If you ask that question, of course, nobody wants a hole in their wall. I certainly don't. But you can you can keep asking why. Why do they want a hole in their wall? This pattern, asking why, what is the customer trying to solve, is going to lead you to very, very powerful messages that will be a lot more effective to sell the product than just talking about maybe a piece of metal, the merits of the team that produced the piece of metal, etc. Because that is not the topic. What really matters is what the user is trying to achieve. This uh, very simple point, uh, that again, comes from a five minute Google search and then thinking about it on the way home, for me was very influential because it made me realize about a very important truth that nobody cares about your platform. You may be spending eight hours a day thinking about it, it's the most important thing for you at work, but everybody else has different problems and that's what they care about, not your platform. So keeping in, in, in your mind what and whose problem are you solving is something that you need to do before you bring the platform out to the rest of the company. And I think there's an important nuance here, the who matters. Different people in the company are going to have different problems. So it's hard to build a single elevator pitch that works with everybody. What I will do in the rest of the presentation is give you four templates, four, four stereotypes of people that I have found in my, in my experience and what are the types of messages that worked with them. The first one is CEOs and executives. A mistake I made here is think, okay, these people are focusing on the strategic, the long-term, the big issues. Therefore, when I'm asking uh, them to give me something for the platform, maybe uh, more hires, attention, uh, support, etc., I need to frame this as a very large strategic issue. And I, I tended to end up in doomsday scenarios where, in a simplified way, I would basically tell them, look, uh, technical debt is going to kill the company in two or three years if you don't invest in the platform. This type of messages is completely ineffective for the CEO. They are just not going to be interested because A, they are dealing with existential issues every single day. It's their bread and butter, so you're not going to impress them. And B, normally these type of claims are going to be exaggerated. Yes, technical debt or best good engineering practices are very important, but they are not typically the reasons that actually kill companies. So what is a more effective message to use with uh, executives? Well, Every single old hands you have, uh, they are going to be talking about some projects that they care about and that they are paying special attention to and they want to see executed. So you can use this information and do some additional research so that you can go to the CEO and maybe tell her, look, I know which is the most important project for you at the moment if you, and, and I know which are the KPIs that you're using to measure success. If you let me participate, if you deploy me as part of this project, I'm going to give power-ups to the teams that are involved so that they deliver 
deliver on, on, on their goals more effectively, more efficiently, uh, etc. So that the KPIs move faster and the, the project is successful. This may look like a detour from achieving whatever you want to achieve, whatever is your vision for the platform. But in the long run, I think it's more effective because when you do this two or three times, what you have is a portfolio of success cases. You can both go back to the CEO and tell her, every time you let me participate in a critical project, the project is successful and I can show measurable impact. So give me more investment because I can scale, I can repeat this to the entire company, every team, every project. Another mistake I made was to uh, frame the platform as a cost-cutting enterprise. This is tempting at the beginning because uh, your first interventions are going to have a lot of impact. They are going to reduce a lot of cost and that looks very good. But I think cost reduction is also a, a Pareto distribution and at some point you're going to reach a point of diminishing returns. The problem is since you have framed yourself as a cost reductor, you're going to be judged as one and it's going to be a lot harder for you to show uh, the value of the platform because it's harder to reduce cost. Um, so a recommendation I would give you is that whenever you talk to executives, you frame the platform uh, in the value side, not in the cost side. You should be talking about how the platform helps the rest of the company produce more value and do it faster and not on the cost reduction. A second profile you will find is the managers. I see the management job as fundamentally juggling three different balls. One of them is you have a team of human beings that you want to uh, collaborate in a healthy way. You want them to produce something that is high quality and you want them to produce something that is aligned with business objectives. The problem is those three uh, balls are hard to reconcile. There's always a tension between them and the managers in the middle. They are receiving pressure from all of those points. Something I found effective with managers is to talk to them, talk to the team and figure out where is that pressure coming from and help them alleviate him, show how the platform can help them. Uh, in one case, uh, we talked to a manager and they were telling us that they had trouble helping their team uh, design effective engineering practices and they, they were slow, they were not delivering as fast as they wanted. So we, we showed them this, uh, this tool that gave them a correlation between the pull request size and the time to merge pull requests. The manager could take this information and have a productive conversation with the team about their code review practices, and it helped them become more effective. If you notice what we're doing here, you're solving a problem for the manager, and the manager is the one that is doing the selling to the team. They are the ambassadors. They are incentivizing them to adopt some of our tools because they will produce these metrics. Another profile is the CSAP in DevOps. Uh, this, uh, I call this the, the people that is always in, in some teams and they are more focused on the infrastructure, the, the tooling, before the company invests in a larger platform. These people are naturally detractors because at the end of the day, you're coming to them with a platform that is going to take away their Legos and remove control from them. So it's completely natural that they are uh, detractors. I think the first thing you need to do is show how you're not a threat to them, but you're an opportunity. You're not going to leave them out of a job and remove all of their control. So how can you do this? A typical conversation we had with them was trying to show how the impact that they have when they work in a single team is very limited. Anything they do only impacts that team. But if they come closer to the platform, if they give us feedback, ideas, and if they contribute to the development of the platform, their impact is going to be increased by a lot. So this is going to ease their fears because they will see you not as something that is threatening to remove control and maybe leave them out of a job. It's the opposite. You're giving them a way out. You're giving them a way of evolving their previous position to a place that has a lot more impact. And if you notice, I haven't talked yet about you as an engineer, but I think here is when you want to show your engineering chops. The image I have on the screen is uh, from The Color of Money. It's a movie with Paul Newman and, and uh, Tom Cruise. They act as hustlers that go to pool venues. They pretend that they know how to play pool and they lose a bunch of bets, but then they raise the stakes. And at that point, they make a killing. They win all the bets. You have to do something very similar. Normally, you're going to have a lot of meetings with engineers, with managers, also with the DevOps, where you're explaining to them what are you doing with the platform, what are the changes, how does it work, etc. These meetings are convenient because the, the, the detractors are going to raise their, hand, their hands and say, this is never going to work, you're not considering all the use cases, etc. At that point, you should have done your homework very well and you should be able to have a deep technical conversation there in front of everybody with this person where you show that you understand deeply what are the concerns, that you have extremely good answers for them and essentially that you know what you're talking about. 
you're not going to convince the detractor, most likely, but you will achieve an important effect, which is that you deactivate them. Because when they go back to their desks and they go back to the kitchen and the detractor starts doing the detraction, this is never going to work, uh, you shouldn't be uh, playing ball and not uh, accepting it, everybody else knows that there are good arguments that you have given them for why, yes, it is going to work and yes, we should adopt it. And the power of the detractor is going to be diminished by a lot. That's a very important thing to do. And finally, the developers. I picture us here as uh, kids playing with Legos, not in a deprecating way. I think it's important to understand that product engineers are focusing on a small part of the overall product. They are enjoying their tools, they are enjoying their own processes, and uh, they also have, unlike kids, they do have pressure from product. When you come with a platform, you're a nuisance. You are telling them they have to change processes, they have to change tools, they have to lose focus from working on their product objectives. Of course, they are going to put resistance. I found this uh, Reddit thread uh, that where a, a developer from a, from a platform team was complaining that they have spent months building the platform and developers hate it and, and he wanted to understand why. It is a great case on all of the things that you shouldn't do. First of all, if you read the story, what you will see is that managers went to a DevOps team, told them to build a platform. The DevOps team built a platform solving their own problems, and then they were trying to get developers to adopt it. This is obviously wrong because developers are never going to listen to you. You're never going to be able to sell anything to them if you don't show interest in their problems in the first place, even before building the platform. It's not only that you need to acquire requisites and figure out what you need to do. You have to show interest because otherwise you will never be able to sell them whatever you produce later. And as I say, you are disrupting their work. You're changing tools, you're changing processes. You are disrupting them when they are trying to achieve their business objectives. So you need to make change palatable. Uh, there are conversations that are hard to have with people and the typical mistake you do is you bring logical arguments. For example, uh, one, one particular case we had was talking about the need for standardizing tools across the company. There are very clear logical arguments for this. The problem is that logical arguments do not work because they work at a larger scale, but they don't work from their perspective. You are disrupting them. There's no point in, in economies of scale for them. So you need to find narratives that are appealing, that give them a reason and an incentive for change. For example, I, I remember uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out images and this type of narratives, and uh, we used this image a lot and, and, and this whole story when we were trying to sell them the need for standardizing tools. And we wouldn't go for the logical argument. We would just tell them or show them how the global logistics system stands upon some basic standards about the size of containers and maybe the anchors. What you're doing here is not focus on the logical argument, not try to convince with reasons, but try to convince with emotion. You are showing an extremely complex technical pro uh, problem. You're showing scale. You're showing challenging in, uh, engineering problems. You're showing engineering for grown-ups, and you're associating your platform with them. So developers are naturally going to be attracted. They are going to see a benefit in adopting the platform because they are growing up as engineers. They will do something more complex, more challenging. Similarly, we would use this image and this whole narrative uh, in all the presentation. We will tell when we were explaining our role, we would tell them, look, we see you as Formula One racers that are in a very tough competition in the market with other uh, players, and we want to help you win those races. We are a team that is supporting you. Of course, what we are doing here is rubbing their egos because everybody likes to feel themselves as a Formula One racer, but it is also partly true. This is the role of a platform team. Again, you're not just giving them cold, boring arguments about economies of scales and cost and yada yada. What you're giving them is something that is appealing, that they will feel attracted to. They will associate platform with, I am a Formula One racer. This is maybe dumb and it's uh, childish, but this is how brains work for everybody. And if you, take, if you manage to get some of these narratives, some of these associations, and make them work across the company, something that you can talk about for developers, for sysadmins, for uh, executives, managers, etc., what you have are very meaningful narratives that are going to create an imaginary associated to your platform that everybody feels attracted to. So the entire topic about we have a platform, it's being developed, we are adopting it, it's something that is going to like, everybody's going to like it in the company, and they are, they are going to be attracted to it as opposed to generate resistance. So these are the main points I made in the presentation, not going to read them, but uh, I will be in the Platform Culture channel after this. Uh, thanks a lot for coming by and see you later.